Welcome to season three of the Empowering Women podcast, a production of the Empowering Women in Industry organization. Together, we will hear from ambitious and inspiring career women as they share their stories of success and overcoming career challenges. I'm Charlie Matthews, founder of Empowering Women, and I am proud to introduce our host, Shannon Bumgarner from Femspired. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Empowering Women in Industry podcast. It's my favorite day recording podcast day, and I am thrilled to have with me today someone I know is going to inspire you and really make you think about your career. So today with me, I have Anna Guru, who is a mechanical engineer. She's an immigrant activist, social media content creator, and a rising entrepreneur. She just recently started her journey in product management, and she's been facilitating a mental health program with the CRRA. Previously, Anna has held roles in different industries, in tech as a mechanical engineer and as an engineering coordinator. And what I really honestly, Anna, love about you most is that you're a strong advocate for women in STEM, and you're really passionate about uplifting the immigrant community. So welcome, Anna, to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And just um, a little um, note, this is Anna's first podcast, so everybody yes. celebrate with me. <laughs> I'm just so excited to have her. So as our yeah, listeners know, to. oh, go ahead, Anna. No, I was just saying I'm excited too. Yeah. yeah. All right. So as our listeners likely know, I love to start the podcast with a tell me your story. And Anna, you have such a unique and inspiring story. So let's start with your immigrant story. And then I think that's going to lead us into your fabulous STEM story. Sounds good. Um, Sure. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, First, I appreciate this opportunity to share my experience on here. Um, I had the opportunity to come to the U.S. at the age of 19 in 2014. And as a refugee of war, I grew up as a nomad. So my family and I have lived in three different countries. And um, prior to getting resettled in the U.S., um, the countries that I've lived at are in Congo, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is where I'm originally from, okay. Kenya, and Uganda, and finally now in the U.S., So upon arrival, I was welcomed by CRRA, which is an agency that um, basically resettles um, asylum or asylum families into the U.S. And um, they're basic. They're based here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so I remember telling the director um, how amazed I am at the number of opportunities available here. And quite frankly, it was overwhelming at first. So. I had to do some research, um, of course, and take a lot of tests to figure out what or where I see myself or what career I want to pursue um, in less than a year. So, um, oh, wow. I t- yeah. So I took a leap of faith and I decided I'm going to pursue a degree in mechanical engineering. First, I did not have any issues with um sciences or mathematics um where i'm where where i finished high school back in uganda um our last two years of college are basic our last two years of high school are basically the first two years of college in america so oh interesting okay so you had a little bit of a head start then right yeah Mm -hmm. so my first two years were um easy i would say um and thankfully, I did take, I did focus on science as well. I was in Uganda, so that made life easy for me the first two years. Okay. So I decided to start my um, journey at CPCC, which is a community college here in um, Charlotte. And um, so I did my first two years there and um, branched out to a four-year college to complete the uh, mechanical engineering degree. It did not take me four years. It took me six years because I was a non-traditional, but right. um, we did it. <laughs> That's right. You did it. Yes. Um, so 
Yeah, for 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 an immigrant that's just coming here, um, I would say that I f- a lot of people find this my story quite fascinating because uh, within I came here obviously without knowing anyone and um, yeah, I was going to ask you to expand on that a little bit when you and I chatted before, just the way you told the story about how you got here and mm-hmm. um, stepping off the plane, just like it took my breath away. So can you share <laughs> that with the audience? Yeah. Um, so first I'll go over the whole uh, process. So as a refugee of war, you come from your original country into the country that you, um, when it, where you resettled are at, sorry. Um, and uh, we were settled in Uganda. We genuinely liked it. Um, it's easier to grow as a person and grow your income mm. if you lived in the city. So we chose to live in the city and not in the camps. And thankfully, sure. we were able to survive. Um, so during that time, we, did, we waited about 10 years um, to get a country that would select our family and that's how the UN does it and through if I may be not explaining this exactly how it is but the UN has different organizations Hmm. with so we came through OIM which is an organization that basically immigrates families to so it takes care of the paying for your flights and all that it actually loans you so we pay for all our flights and everything Okay, and so, so you, you had to fund your way here. Yes, Once you I were did. selected and they said you're allowed to immigrate to the United States, you had to fund that travel process. Is that right? After, yes. After, so okay. After I arrived here, I, I'm given three three months to pay it back. So, oh, okay. Okay, so they pay it up front and then you pay them back. Okay, makes yeah, sense. Yeah, so you pay it back in installments, yeah. Um, and so one day, two weeks, it was, as I said before, two weeks. We got a call two weeks prior to our, our uh, flight. We got a call that say that you have been selected to go to Charlotte, North Carolina. And Which just I blows think- my mind because in literally, <laughs> audience, I don't know if you caught that, but literally in two weeks, she yes. turned, Anna and her family turned their entire life upside down. Yeah. So we had to sell everything. We had to uh, figure out what weather was what weather was it in North Carolina at that time, uh, which was in April. And mm. so spring, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. It's still a little tricky though, but yeah. 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 Still a little bit colder for somebody like somebody coming from tropical weather. So. Sure. Um, we came here um, two weeks later. We were here. Um, it was tough. I, I was homesick for sure. I will say I came here at 19. So I've left all my childhood, all my friends, all my family, extended family. So it was like starting brand new with one suitcase. And quite frankly, my mom probably had $200 for the entire family. Oh, my <laughs> so. goodness. And, and just uh, for the audience, uh, your, how many brothers and sisters do you have? So I have five siblings, um, okay. four sisters and one brother. We're four sisters and one brother, and um, I have a twin sister who's also a yep. civil engineer who recently graduated as well with me. Yeah, and I can't wait to meet her, Anna. I know. <laughs> She's she, on my she list <laughs> of people I really want to meet. So yeah, I just really want to quickly repeat that for the audience. So think about it. She, Anna and her family got a call. Two weeks later, they're here in Charlotte, North Carolina. They don't know anyone. I think they helped you find an apartment. but. Yes. Um, I think you only you had a limited time and then you had to make sure you made your own arrangements. Mm-hmm. You're here in a foreign country. Um, you may or may not speak English at all. I can't remember. But I, I mean, think about that, right? Yeah. So thankfully, um, in Uganda, we speak British English. It was okay. a slight transition that I had to make, which is okay. just spellings and Okay, well, good. At least you didn't have to learn it from complete, like, ground up. That would have been just (laughs) crazy. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, but I love that story, and I love the fact, um, I know your sister's also an engineer. You have other technical siblings as well, right? Yes. So my... My um my big sister is married to an electrical engineer. <laughs> okay. And um she is a nurse. So Okay, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yeah. So your mom definitely did something right. Uh, that's all yeah. I got to say, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she did. She tried. 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and, and one of the ways I know that you and I become connected is that you've built a social media community regarding supporting those who want to pursue STEM as obviously an education as well as a career. How mm-hmm. did that begin for you? And then what, what kind of content or support are you providing as part of that channel? So when I started, uh, this was during my sophomore year in college. Um, okay. And this was after transferring. I, I've, I had to change. First of all, I had to find a different job to be able to fit my um, schedule, my school schedule. Okay. And so during that time, it's, it, of course, I had so much pressure as somebody that's supporting herself. I thought of ways and ideas to um, to be able to make side income. And so I definitely went the influencer route and did the, uh, I, I do share content on Instagram. Okay. Um, and it, it all started out with my passion, which has always been supporting women in STEM, advocating for women in STEM, specifically women of color. And... Um, I just started sharing my story. I started sharing my experiences, my internship experiences. I started sharing my daily experience at work and school. And it brought, uh, we have been able to build this whole community of women. And we run campaigns starting from voting to um, let's run a campaign on imposter syndrome for mm. how women struggle with imposter syndrome specifically in stem um so it's just i've built this incredible community that's been able to support me in many ways we've supported each other in many ways we're always happy to meet new people and just be part of the community yeah, yeah absolutely yeah um any, any story that stood out to you as part of that community or an event that happened with that community that really stands out to you? Yes. Um, so last year during COVID, there was a lot of campaigns going on on social media. Oh, sure. <laughs> and yeah. um, so we, there were two campaigns that I was part of. The first one was the uh, Black Engineers in STEM, Black okay. Female Engineers in STEM. And we did a video on what we do um so it was just basically like how you look like while working from home and then after um so let's say (laughs) when you're going out for drinks with your friends right (laughs) Um, i love that yeah we did a video on that and it was incredible um we it's it's funny how when you're doing things like that for me it's fun and i enjoy it and so when you see how much it's impacted people and more people came out and said Oh my God! I experienced that too. Oh, I um, and it's just you. you it, it's been able to introduce more people into my life that um uh-huh. have created this support system. And so the next campaign that we created was on AOC Alexandra okay. Ocasio, and um, yep. she. So last year she, I if I could be wrong, but um, she had um. She had a situation in uh, Congress where one of the congressmen, uh, one of the senators or congressmen, um, yep. called her uh, the a B word. So, <laughs> and her response to it and how she how she carried herself was just amazing. So we came together with all these women in STEM um, and created a whole thread of posts on um, things we struggle with. So mine was imposter syndrome. And so you we, we listed what we do, things we struggle with, and um, all that good stuff. It got shared through so many uh, platforms, and we were able to um, get awareness. You know, as women in STEM, it's difficult out there. Mm, um, it is. We're kind of not noticed. We, we're not recognized out there, specifically engineers. Um, so doing things like that has brought in, has brought it, has brought in so much. It's very satisfying on my end and has also, I believe we've increased the amount of women seeking to pursue engineering. Yep. So, and I love um, Anna how you're creating the space because I think women in STEM often feel isolated. To your point, yes, mm-hmm. and we feel alone. And 
just to even have that community, if, if it's not somebody that you can see, at least it's somebody that you can communicate with and share that with and grow with. So I really love, it sounds like you just have an incredible network yeah, that you've built yeah. and that you use to support each other as well as yourself. I love it. Yeah. I'm grateful for them. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I'm grateful <laughs> for the community that's on, that's, that's listening to us right now. <laughs> so speaking of that community, um, there's been an outshoot of that community. Um, so tell us a little bit more about how you landed your current role. Um, I, it's so fascinating. And I just think it's a great outshoot of that community as well as networking in a virtual age. So um, <clears throat> it's interesting how I got this role. So I am I currently um, accepted a role in product management. I am the new product management specialist working at Train Technologies um, with Value Products. So I, quite frankly, during that time that the COVID um, delete that. So. During COVID, um, it was difficult finding jobs. I'm pretty sure a lot of people went through that. Um, and so, obviously, I was applying. I had just graduated. I was applying everywhere. Sure. Yes, I got calls. I got interviews. I got some good offers um, that I thought would be great for my career. But it, w it all happened, I think. I had an offer, then got a message from... Antoine, who is my current boss, boss. Um, and uh, he reached out. He was like, I've, I, I've seen you around on social media. Mm -hmm. um, it's incredible what work you're doing out there and setting um, a standard for women, specifically black women. Um, and it was just he, it was just amazing that it all came from hashtags that I used on Instagram. Um, which and I just love that. So just to kind of tie a couple things off here, the audience would not know. So mm -hmm. Antoine, I'm giving you a shout out if you're listening to this. Um, so <laughs> Antoine and I are actually connected through a, a prior role that I had. And then he's now your, you know, your leader, as you mentioned. So it's mm -hmm. funny how it's such a small world. Um, I know. I know. And he yeah. reached out to you if I understood you correctly because of a hashtag and your work on social media with women in STEM. Is that, is that right? Yes. 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 So he, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's the post with uh, the black women and engineers. Um, mm. He found it through, through hashtags and uh, through all these social media platforms. And uh, he connected with me and said, hi, um, so we're looking for somebody in product management, specifically someone from, someone local from UNCC. And so I said, hey, I'm looking for a job. Um, I'd be happy to interview for it. And so that's how I ended up here. I just think that is fantastic. And yeah. um, Eddie, you may not realize this, but the founder of Empowering Women in Industry is Charlie Matthews. And Charlie has a social media company for technical brands. So nice. I know that she's listening and cheering on this right now because you really landed your role based on social media. So yes. I, I slipped that question in there for, for her benefit. I knew she would love it. Nice. Yeah. So I want to switch to gears just slightly. And you sort of alluded to this earlier with imposter syndrome, but I know in your academic career and in now in your professional career, I know that you found yourself as the first or the only in situations. I, I'm pretty positive. Um, yeah. So what helpful advice would you have for our listeners if they find themselves in the same situation? So um, every day, I mean, you will go through micro my, microaggressions, um, mm. like awkward comments on your outfit or ethnicity, um, my my colleagues ignoring me in the past, not at my current role, but uh, you'll have situations where your colleagues or your classmates are ignoring you in meetings and um, diverting the conversation to what they want to talk about rather than what you brought to the table. So the best way I'd say I deal with it, especially since I have so many things to worry about, <laughs> um, the best way I deal with it is to know how to advocate for myself uh, within mm. an organization. Um, oh, I, I've always found that finding that one co-worker, preferably someone who has more experience than you, um, 
always asking them to mentor you or even start slowly by making friends within the organization. And when someone disrespects or diminishes your talents or skills, I always say that know that you're above that and they're probably projecting something about themselves on you. So right. just always knowing that you're above that and um, being comfortable with yourself. That's yeah, I key. love that. I love yeah. the advocating for yourself. I think that's so mm-hmm. true. Yeah. Um, and I guess you probably would feel more comfortable if you have that one or two people that really support you at work that you can call on the great days and then you can yes. call on the not so great days, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You alluded earlier to imposter syndrome, and I know a lot of our listeners, as well as yours truly over here, struggle with imposter syndrome. Can you elaborate a little bit on how that's impacted you professionally or or personally? Mm -hmm. So I'll give a little bit of background. Um, Okay, perfect. So my imposter syndrome comes from me sitting here and saying, how did I end up here? Is my question. Because you're amazing. That's how you ended up here. And I'm going to yes. take a really quick shout out to Christina. You know who you are. Thank you for introducing me to Anna. So that's how you got here, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Christina. Um, yeah. I, I just, it's just, it's just, I think a situation type of thing where I have gone through so much and I have definitely put in oh, so yeah. much work that I got here. I, I definitely did. I know that I deserve to be where I'm at and I am in the right place and all that, but coming from not from no opportunities to opportunities and you're like, okay, it's real. It's happening. I actually, I'm somebody, I'm an engineer. Okay. Do they trust me? (laughs) Do they they trust me to do the job? You know? So it's just, I, I, it has impacted me when it comes to, for example, find myself, checking my work 10 times just because I don't believe it's how it should be or I don't mm-hmm. believe it's how the com- but my boss wants it to look like, you know? Yeah. And many times I'll go show him the work and he's like, this is amazing. And it's just something I think us as immigrants deal with, specific most of us deal with, because um, we didn't have these opportunities. Now we have them yeah. and we're here and we don't, think we should be here but it's a no no, I can really you and I when we talked earlier we talked about like how different our backgrounds are right Uh um and I could really I mean I don't obviously understand it but I can intellectually understand how that would create imposter syndrome yeah yeah absolutely one of my favorite quotes Anna is from Brene Brown and all my audience knows I'm a huge Brene Brown fan, but mm-hmm. I always introduce myself as a recovering perfectionist. And she has a quote that says, I'm a recovering perfectionist. I'm mm-hmm. an aspiring good enoughist. Oh, wow. So, so mean, that's, that's my, good. that's a quote <laughs> I'm going to put on my wall. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to need that one too. I love Brene Brown. Yeah. Read oh, good. In a while. There you go. Yeah. yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, so you mentioned being an, an immigrant, and I know we've we've had that thread throughout our conversation, but I know that you're really passionate about and active in supporting the immigrant community. So mm-hmm. tell our audience a bit about those activities and what drives you to give back to the immigrant yeah. community. Sure. Um, so I just completed a program with Carolina. CRA is Carolina Refugee Resettlement Agency, again. Okay. And so there was a... So last year, um, we all know how COVID impacted everyone's lives when it comes to emotional and mental support. And so at the end of the year, I think it was around Christmas, I sat down with the director of CRA. She's like a family friend, uh, Marsha. And so I said, Marsha, we need somebody to, we need a program specifically for refugees um, to support with mental health and emotional support. And um, I pitched my idea, was like, hey, it's COVID, refugees, imagine immigrants or refugees who've arrived during COVID. It's a whole different experience compared to someone that arrived when everything was normal. So um, I suggested we should uh, probably have a mental health program. She looked at what resources she had and thankfully has highest, um, highest, which is I don't want to make that wrong. <laughs> Delete that. Um, 
So HIAS, which is an organization that um, has all these programs that support refugees or refugee agencies around okay. America. And so they had a program uh, for mental health support and okay. where I orchestrated a class of five to eight refugees starting last spring. Um, we just completed our classes and the goal was to improve their emotional well-being. Simple, um, especially since with immigrants, um, that topic mental health is has such a stigma that no one that no one actually talks about. So hmm. it was great bringing all these women who have children um, that are growing up in America and educating them on. Um, how to process depression, how to process anxiety and um, what resources you have available to you. And so I, I'm i so proud of what we did, the work we did with my, team, with my um, class and definitely hope we have more of those in the future. Okay. Um, any I moment have- stick out to you or any individual? Because I, I, I think mental health in general is a stigma, but the learning I had from you was that maybe it's even more of a stigma if you're an immigrant here to the U S that maybe it's, you know, culturally, I'm not sure, but, Mm -hmm. and I never thought about it that way. And here you've landed in this strange land. You really don't want to talk about it anyway. Mm -hmm. And we're all sitting here at home going, I don't want to touch people. I don't want to get near people. And they're all like, now what do I do? (laughs) Yeah. Um, so yes, to your point. Yeah. Um, with immigrants talking about, mental health it's like saying you're crazy you've lost your mind and um, oh, okay yeah so it's not taken as a it's taken like you, you've lost your mind you're crazy you've gone mad okay basically. so and so when the nature of this class was unique we had to change the entire program and make sure that it fits the type of group that we are speaking to and Again, you have to note that we're changing the language too. So you have Oh wow, to, okay. Yeah. So you have to change how you're sending the message, making sure that the message is received in the right way. And it's not saying that, so you're crazy. We've all lost our minds and all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we may have all lost our mind. I think there was a yeah. point there when I think the whole country was gonna lose its mind, but <laughs> I agree. Yeah. But um yeah, so the, the moment that stuck out to me was when one time we're sitting and having these conversations and this woman says, I did not know that I actually just have anxiety, that I am not crazy. I haven't lost my mind. I just do not. I just have anxiety. And just that breakthrough was amazing for a oh, woman. Bad an older woman above her forties that has grown up in a conservative African culture to say that was just amazing. Um, and thankfully she's going to get the help that she needs. Um, my goal is really just to normalize mental health for immigrants specifically. Yeah. I I can't even imagine the stress of that situation coming to a new country in the middle of COVID. Like COVID was bad enough for a native Mm -hmm. American, a native um, American like myself. I cannot imagine what it would be like uh, for someone brand new to the U S and then to your point, I think it's hard enough for somebody like myself to say, I have anxiety in this case. Mm -hmm. And then what bravery, right? I mean, that moment when she said that had to take your breath away. Yeah. What bravery. Wow. Mm -hmm. I I love it. And is that a program that's going to continue you think, or. So this program is it's, this is the second time it's being run. Um, Okay. Hoping that it, it, they, they, they continue it again. Um, I think they will. Uh, If they do, I'll still be facilitating. Okay. But on top of that, I have also worked with um, non-profit, nonprofit organizations like Nera Pro Choice America, which is an organization that advocates for women's reproductive rights. Um, oh, okay. Oh, my goodness. Do you sleep? So I just want to tell you that this is an overriding theme on this podcast. I get on with these fabulous women and they tell me all the things they're doing. And that's the first thing that pops in my head is you actually sleep. <laughs> 
No, I don't. I actually don't. <laughs> I, I, I think it's just a thing where I just, if, if it's something that means some, it means a lot to me and I know that I'm going to be impacting people's lives, I just say yes. That's it. Just say yes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually um, the title of a Shonda Rhimes book, I think, which is amazing, by the oh, way, really? for the audience, if you've not read it. Have you read it? I haven't read it. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's worth it. Um, and, and, and I have some extra copies at work if you, if you want one. So let me yes, know. Yes. I would love that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so worked with them last year, um, to vocalize reproductive rights for women on social media. And also I have also, and quite frankly, this, this alongside with, um, all the other organizations that I've worked with, it has exposed me to so many experiences and I have learned so much on inclusion and equity for all in America, mm. which has been amazing. Um, yeah. And I don't, is that a relatively new concept for you or did you bring oh, yes. some of that in your immigrant experience? I brought some of that from my household. I don't know about everyone's household. Okay. My household, women are, equal to men and we should be able to do the same thing based off of what my mom raised me with um but it wasn't very it really isn't normal to see somebody vocalize equity or um inclusion for women okay back where i'm from so I used to watch it on TV for sure i used to watch right. all the campaigns going on in america or outside of um huh where I, where I was raised and that built that uh fire in me <laughs> and so when I came here I was like okay I'm going to do everything possible to make sure I have the right people around me that support um inclusion and equity so I did have the seed planted in my head okay yeah so I love your mom already, so she's on my list too. I want to meet your mom and your sister. <laughs> she's, she's raised amazing. such an amazing, amazing, amazing woman. Yeah. 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 So as we near the end of our time together, so what's next for you, either from your career journey? I um, mean, we talked a little bit about your immigrant experience and what you're continuing to get back, but there could be more. Just curious to leave our audience with what's next for Anna. So um, I'm excited to continue doing what I do on social media and probably even do more. Um, I definitely want to see myself grow as, as I was growing up. Um, I've always looked at the tall building and said, I'm going to be the boss at the tall building. The main, main All right, boss. write this down <laughs> audience. You're going to see Anna CEO one day, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I do eventually want to end up in uh, top leadership. Um, and Still give back. Um, activism has always been a thing that I grew up with based off of the experiences that I've had growing up. And so definitely going to still be speaking up for um, the minorities and um, the things I care about. Yeah. And Anna, we need you more than ever. I think one of the, we talked about this in our prior call, but the stats for women in engineering is still just not where we want it to be. I may get them a little wrong audience, but from the society of women engineers, women graduating engineering slash computer science degrees are still in the, I would say the low 20%. Mm -hmm. um, and Anna, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think for women of color, that number is much smaller. I think it's around six to 7%. Mm -hmm. So it's just, we've got so much work to do. And I am grateful that you're out there doing the work. I honestly, especially for women of color, they need to see role models like you out there. And I, I think one of the big learnings for me in the past year was that, uh, and it really honestly was when Kamala Harris became vice president of the United States. I yes. never really sunk in for me and how important that representation really is. And obviously mm -hmm. she's not in a technical field, but Still, it really went home for me about how important that representation really is. And Titi Soleil, if you're out there listening, you said the same thing back a couple episodes <laughs> ago. So that's really sunk in for me. So Anna, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, um, how brave you, you are and just standing out there and speaking your mind. So speaking thank of you. speaking your mind, um, where can our audience find you on what social media channels can they find you? Um, so you can find me on social media so instagram it's 
A N N underscore L I N D A two. Okay. And um, for LinkedIn, it's Ananguru as in A N N A, and last name is N G U R U. Um, you can also reach me at my email and Linda with an H and 2015 at gmail.com. Yep. And as usual, um, audience, I will have those contacts in the show notes um, so that you won't have to remember it all, but I want you to hear it from her. Um, and I am so grateful now that you're part of my network. Thank you so much for your time and congratulations on your first podcast episode. Thank you. This was fun. I'm it- so glad that I was, be- I was, picked to be part of this podcast absolutely you've earned it you weren't picked you earned it thanks anna (laughs) to our listeners thank you and we'll see you next time bye everybody bye